I don't need much But the shoes on my feet Black coffee in the morning A couple bites to eat I ain't impressed With fancy cars and diamond rings Cause I got me a treasure More precious than anything And that girl's love Is more than enough A truck train accident Friday evening unexpectedly took the lives of two prominent farmers of Beaver City. Ralph Newell Warner and his uncle Leon George Warner were killed shortly after 6 o'clock when their southbound truck was struck by a westbound Burlington train at a crossing four miles west of town. The driver, Ralph Warner, was just 12 days shy of his 38th birthday. His passenger, Leon Warner, more well known as Jerry, was a highly respected farmer and rancher. He also served as a flight instructor, serving two years with the Army Air Corps during World War I. He attended Hastings College, transferred to the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, where he played football for both squads. Jerry was twice named as the best quarterback in the Missouri Valley Conference. He was 71. We'd like you to think about the state of Nebraska in the late 1880s. Your head may fill with visions of small farming towns, corn and cattle among the rolling hills. Off in the distance, there's the sound of a steam engine filled with supplies, the local mail, and perhaps passengers. Late February of 1888, Leon George Warner was born in a sod house in central Nebraska. The Warner family farmed near Hendley and Pawnee City. Leon earned his diploma from the nearby Franklin Academy, a private Christian school. As he grew up, Leon was given the nickname Jerry by friends. His family continued to call him Leon, his given name, but to everyone else, he was Jerry. He was close to his siblings, especially his young sister, Flora. In the spring of 1907, the family packed up and moved just outside Beaver City. Jerry helped establish the family farm, but he had more lofty dreams and goals. He wanted to go to college. At Hastings, Jerry studied business and played the end position on the football team, as well as keeping his family updated weekly. Hello, Ralph. I said I'd send you a picture when I had one taken. This one was taken just at the end of the Grand Island game, so you can see how I look. Wish you could see us play. My previous weight is 156 pounds stripped or 164 pounds in my clothes. Went into the game lots, been playing on my nerve. Football wasn't the only thing on Jerry's mind. He wanted to see and experience everything. His mother, Eliza, received a postcard from her son that came from the state capitol. A group of students traveled to Lincoln to take part in the presidential election rallies. Jerry was excited to see the Democratic nominee, Nebraska native William Jennings Bryan. It was a great fight to the finish. The town is ours tonight. Whoopee! Played our biggest game today with Doan. We won four to zero in the last few minutes of play. The enthusiasm was sure something fierce. I am pretty sore. I guess I'll get well. Leon. Jerry enjoyed his time with the Hastings Tigers. He had a lot of talent and passion for football, but he knew there was more out there. Summer 1909, he returned to Beaver City. The family farm comforted him, but he knew what he had to do. His train ticket was stamped Lincoln, Nebraska. At 21 years old, the Furnace County farm kid enrolled in the University of Nebraska. He pledged the Kappa Sigma fraternity and was asked to join the football team. Head coach William King Cole kept him on the reserve squad for the first year. Cole began to utilize his ends and backs with a new passing game. Warner became a big part the next year, the 1910 Cornhuskers.
The game of college football was vastly different than the current version we see today. The field was 110 yards long. A team only had three downs to reach 10 yards. The forward pass was legal. However, the quarterback had to be five yards behind the line. If the pass was incomplete, the ball was spotted where the pass was thrown from. The ball could not be thrown more than 20 yards in the air. Until the beginning of the season, any man carrying the football had to run into the line within five yards of the tackles. 1910 was the first year the ball carriers could run outside, sideline to sideline. And perhaps most importantly, when a team scored a touchdown, which was five points, they could elect to have the ball kicked right back to them. That rule alone would account for some of the most lopsided scores in the history of the sport. In the summer of 1910, Cole's job was in question. Many thought he wasn't the man they needed and openly called for his dismissal. Coach King Cole, who has already guided the Cornhusker team in three seasons of varying success, will be on trial. It's the expressed opinion of the alumni and undergraduates of the Lincoln School that King Cole failed to get the results last fall that the material warranted. To his re-election for this season, there was considerable opposition, and the Nebraska Board of Control was petitioned to secure the services of another man for the 1910 season. Wishes of the students and alumni were given little heed, and Coach Cole was given another lease on life. All of Cole's critics realize just how the situation stands for this fall, and they will be watching closely every movement of the coach. Cole will have to make good, and making good this fall means turning out a team that will win the championship of the Missouri Valley in order to refute all the damaging statements that have been made. Omaha Daily Bee, September 4th, 1910. With the coaching drama behind them, the team started to take shape for the upcoming season. The roster was full of kids from all corners of the state. The program had size and speed rarely seen. There were two large and aggressive tackles up front, Jack Temple and Sylvester Shanka. The backfield was talented. At 185 pounds, there was fullback Harvey Rathbone and possibly the fastest player on the field, running back Owen Frank. The ends were going to challenge the visiting teams. They had a shifty running style and could catch the football, making the offense move. Walt Shawner and Jerry Warner. The quarterback position was locked in. Herbert Potter returned as starter with his backup, Harry Miner. Unfortunately, that fell apart. Potter contracted scarlet fever and missed the entire season. Harry Miner stepped in, but injured his shoulder and became ineligible for the first game because of his failing grades. Coach Cole needed a quarterback to run his offense. This year, the forward flip should be one of the Cornhuskers' strongest cards. The improvement is largely due to Jerry Warner, Nebraska's new quarterback. In the practice to date, Warner has demonstrated that he should develop into a sterling quarterback. He is a marvel for speed and the shiftiest dodger in returning punts or in skirting the ends. Warner's forward passes have been invariably perfect, shooting the oval with deadly accuracy. Warner is to pilot the Cornhuskers Saturday in their first gridiron clash of the season. And should the Nebraskans run up anything approaching a score, it is conceded that Warner's individual prowess and brilliance will prove an important factor. Lincoln Journal Star, September 30th, 1910. Of course, there is no film or audio of the plays. Radio and TV broadcasts of football did not begin for another 30 years. So, what you're about to see is a recreation of each play using video from the A7FL and the voice of a respected sports commentator. According to the newspaper reports, these plays are accurate.
It's a beautiful October day here at Nebraska Field. The Peru Bobcats made the short trip from the beautiful Oak Bowl to take on King Cole's Cornhuskers. Back to receive the kick, making his debut with the varsity squad is quarterback Jerry Warner. We've heard amazing things about this young man from Beaver City. Played very well for the reserve squad in Ott 9 and filled the position vacated by last year's starter Herbert Potter. We hear his bout with Scarlet Fever is going well. As the kick is made, Warner will take it at the 15, follows his blockers to the right. This kid has some amazing speed as he crosses midfield. There isn't a Bobcat within 15 yards. Nobody's going to catch Jerry Warner on his way to a 90-yard touchdown. The scoring has been plentiful for the Cornhuskers in this contest so far. We're early here in the third quarter, and momentum is definitely with the Scarlet and Cream. Third down for Peru Normal on their 20. Warner sets up to return on the Bobcat 50. It's a high kick. He's going to take it on the run at the 42. Makes one man miss, then another. Turns on the speed to the 15, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Jerry Warner, his second of the game. That puts Warner over 150 return yards so far today. First down, and the Bobcats haven't found an answer for the Cornhusker run game. The play comes in from King Cole. We may see more of running back Owen Frank, or maybe Warner will tote the oval. It's going to be Warner. There's no one near him. He's got one man to beat. He may have the angle. The Cornhusker quarterback is tripped up after 30. First down. Warner settles in behind center Sid Collins. Barks out his cadence. Rolls to the left. Looking to throw. He's got his end open and hits him with a perfect dart for a 12-yard gain. The left-handed speedster finds Walt Shawner for the first down. Ward from the coaching staff. Warner is ambidextrous and can throw equally as accurate with the right. Warner finishes the contest with 87 yards on the ground, was 12 of 18 for 150 yards through the air with two rushing touchdowns, a punt, and a kickoff return for a score. I'd say the Nebraska Cornhuskers found themselves a quarterback that can do it all. And the Coyotes and Cornhuskers are ready to hit the field. South Dakota's heard about the offensive explosion Nebraska unleashed last Saturday. They're going to have to find a way to slow down the four-headed monster that is the Nebraska running game. Fullback Harvey Rathbone scored six touchdowns last week. Right tackle Sylvie Shanka drug would-be tacklers like they were little children. Running back Owen Frank is one of the fastest men in the history of Nebraska football, perhaps second only to quarterback Jerry Warner. Nebraska trying to get things going their way here in the opening quarter. First and 10, Cornhuskers on the South Dakota 25. Frank and Rathbone in the backfield. Warner takes the snap, follows his line straight up the field, cuts left and sprints toward the goal line, bouncing off a coyote at the 15. He's finally tripped up. The ball is spotted at the five. Backaberry back to punt for the Coyotes. It's a high kick. Warner settles in at the 27. Stumbles a bit but keeps his feet. And he's brought down by a host of players. And the Nebraska players and coaches are beside themselves. A South Dakota player jumped on the pile after Warner was down. It looks like he drove his knees into Warner's back. The Nebraska sideline is furious. They've been complaining about the extracurricular punishment primarily by the safety Mr. Smith. They help the Cornhusker quarterback to his feet, and he's going after his attacker. Jerry Warner has said, I've had enough of you to the Coyote safety with his fist. Both sidelines rush in to break up the fight. The referee is trying to maintain some order. They're walking Warner now back to the Nebraska bench. Judging by the reaction of King Cole, Warner has been ejected. Cole wants an explanation, and he, I, I don't believe it. Smith has chased the crew across the field and has jumped on the back of Jerry Warner. They're fighting again. The referee really needs to put his foot down on this type of behavior. Someone has grabbed Smith and knocked him to the ground, stopping the altercation. I guess the officials are tired of Smith's actions as well. It was the referee that shoved him. 12 to 6. Not the powerful offense we saw last week, but the defense held things together. Coming off a tough win against the Coyotes, the 2-0 Cornhuskers were about to face the biggest challenge on their schedule. A road trip to Minneapolis, Minnesota to play the Gophers and one of the best quarterbacks in the country. In an attempt to confuse the Gopher sidelines, Coach Cole kept announcing different lineups with players filling positions they've never played before. 
The Minnesota team and newspaper saw right through it. In response, the Star Tribune misreported the actual size of the Gopher players. When the two teams lined up, Nebraska realized they were outweighed at every position. Jerry Warner started a quarterback, but the Nebraska offense was non-existent. Warner had the only respectable gain of 25 yards in the fourth quarter. There were many injuries on the Cornhusker squad, but they were beaten, not broken. Denver made no gain on its first drive. They're setting up to punt to Warner. He's camped out at the Nebraska 35. He makes the catch and reverses field. Breaks a tackle at the 40. He could go 45, 50, dodging a tackler. He's off to the races. And a diving Denver defender just catches the streaking Cornhusker. First and 10 on the Denver 35. Jerry Warner flips the field with another fantastic return, but he heads towards the sideline. Seems to be favoring his back. Looks like Owen Frank will be called into quarterback duty once again as trainer Jack Best sees to the hobbled starter. As a result of his fight with the South Dakota safety in week two, Jerry had been playing with a bruised back. He also took some hard hits from the Minnesota defense, making his injury worse. There were conflicting reports in the newspapers on the condition of the superstar quarterback. The Journal Star reported it as a wrenched back. The Omaha Bee said it was an injury to his spine. Unfortunately, this caused a concern with Jerry's parents in Beaver City. Two days before the next game, Jerry's father traveled to Lincoln to check on him, which was roughly a seven hour trip. When he saw his son, his worry turned to relief and then to frustration because the Omaha Bee story was incorrect. Next on their schedule was the Doan Tigers. King Cole openly admitted the game was an afterthought. Nebraska was practicing the offense they would use at Kansas. Because Cole chose to start mostly reserve players against Doan, several starters were on the sideline in street clothes. Luckily, the Nebraska reserves won, but it was a close victory, winning 6-0. to zero. After weeks of preparation and nursing injuries, the day finally arrived. The battle between the two best teams in the Missouri Valley Conference. Both teams healthy and ready for a fight. This should be the last play of the third quarter. The Jayhawks and Cornhuskers deadlocked at zero in front of 6,000 screaming fans in Lawrence. Nebraska's only attempted one pass so far this contest and has had a bit of an issue with fumbling. They put the ball on the ground five times today and lost the ball. First and 10 on the Nebraska 45. Warner looks over the KU defense. He'll call his own number. Starting right, breaks through the line. Nearly brought down in the backfield. He heads up the right sideline, is hit at midfield, and stays on his feet. Running away from the failed tackler, he's to the 45 and caught from behind. Warner shakes him off, cuts back to his right, dodges two men at the 40, finally brought down after 30 yards. The feet of the Beaver City native gives Nebraska first down at the Kansas 35-yard line to end the quarter. Looking to secure their first outright Missouri Valley Conference title, the Cornhuskers must first put down the Aggies from Iowa. Second possession for Nebraska this game, third and three on the Ames 42. Cornhuskers not showing a punt formation as you normally would on third down. King Cole says we're going for it. Warner steps under center, drops straight back. Frank snuck through the line and is alone in the center of the Aggie defenders. Warner sidesteps a rusher and completes the pass for 15 yards. First down on the NU 53, Jerry Warner fights his way up the right side behind big Sylvester Shanka for five yards. It looks like left end Walt Shawner was injured on the play, falling down on the north sideline seemingly untouched. The referee checks on him and walks away. He must not be injured, but he's choosing not to leave the field and is being totally ignored by the home team sideline. He's also being ignored by the Aggies defense. Collins hikes it to Warner, pitches it to the halfback. He's gonna throw! Shawner got up and ran uncovered down the sideline, making the 
catch. Second down for the Aggies. The Nebraska defensive line has been a wall so far today. Iowa has not had any luck inside the tackles. Hurst is going to receive the snap and head around the right end. He's met hard at the line of scrimmage and dropped by Jerry Warner. Warner using his quickness to sidestep the blocker, taking down the Iowa quarterback with a touchdown saving show of strength. The Furnace County farm boy picked up the much heavier ball carrier and planted him violently into the turf here at Nebraska Field. First possession of the second quarter at the Cornhusker 25. Warner sweeps right for six yards and left end Walt Shawner once again lays face down on the 30, just two yards from the Nebraska sideline. Let's see if the Aggie defense have clued in. And they haven't. The direct snap to halfback Owen Frank. He fires it straight to the uncovered end, being forced out after 14 yards. The Iowa coaches have got to be fuming. Not once, but twice, the Nebraska offense gained a first down using a player hiding in plain sight. King Cole seemingly drawing plays up in the dirt, and they're all working. First down after the Aggie fumble on the Nebraska 35-yard line. Warner runs a sweep left with Frank and Rathbone out to block, and it's stopped before, wait! Left tackle Jack Temple has the ball. He ran over an Iowa defender, and the 200-pounder has a head of steam and has nobody within 25 yards. He's lumbering up the north sideline, shakes off another man. Being tracked by Hurst, the Aggie speedster jumps on the back of the corner. Her team captain on the 10. He manages to trip him up, and what started 74 yards ago has ended on the Iowa one-yard line. The peekaboo play, as head coach William Cole calls it. Everyone on the Cornhusker offense ran left. Center Sid Collins held the ball between his legs, and left tackle Jack Temple grabbed the oval and took off to the right. He was 20 yards downfield before any of us knew what was happening. They're hurrying to the line. A quick snap sends Warner off the right tackle for three. <laughs> and here it comes, folks. Shawner is once again lying face down along the sideline, motionless. The cries from the stands are alerting the defense. Warner takes a quick snap, turns left, and fires to the now standing end. Shawner sidesteps the first defender and steps out after a 15-yard gain. Oh, the boys sure seem to be having fun out there today. And that's the gun. In 1907, head coach William King Cole and his team shared a piece of the Missouri Valley title. In 1910, the whole thing belongs to your Nebraska Cornhuskers, outright Missouri Valley Conference champions. It's a beautiful Thanksgiving day in Lincoln, Nebraska. The home team has invited the Haskell Indians over for a not-so-friendly game of football. Roughly 5,000 football fans here at Nebraska Field. They're enjoying the shirt sleeve weather for today's contest. 53 degrees and sunny for the 2.30 kickoff. We've got fresh sod on the field and a Nebraska team looking to avenge their home loss to the Indians last year. The Haskell team has overgone a massive house cleaning in both player and coaches. The pay for play scandal has given us the team we see here today. Just two players on the roster were part of last year's squad. Not many people are giving them a chance today against this Cornhusker team. The Indians defense has stopped Nebraska at midfield, forcing the home team to punt. Owen Frank calls out for the ball and puts his powerful foot into it. It's a booming kick. Iron Cloud was set up on the 15. He quickly retreats to the five, makes the catch at the two and turns to run. Oh, he's hit hard by Miner. The force of the hit throws him backwards across the goal line. He tries to catch his footing and is demolished by Shanka and Warner for the safety. Cornhuskers two, Haskell zero. Warner calls the play and keeps it himself over the left end behind Captain Jack Temple for 10 yards in the first down. They quickly regroup and reset for the next play. It's a pass. Warner has a man in the left corner of the end zone. It's Shawner and it's a touchdown. Warner to Shawner for 20 yards and the score. With the score quickly getting out of reach for Haskell, you have to wonder, when will we start to see substitute players? Warner with the quarterback keeper up the middle, and he's slammed to the ground by his headgear by Indian linebacker Williams. A violent but legal tackle. We may start to see less of the Cornhusker starting quarterback as his face is looking a little worse for wear.
That's a touchdown by right tackle Sylvie Shankoff, dragging six, yes, six Haskell players over the goal line with it. That ends the third quarter with the score. Nebraska 101, Haskell 0. We've received word that head coach William Cole, more commonly known as King Cole in these parts, announced to the team at halftime he received word just prior to the game that his brother James had passed away. He was asked to return to Chicago immediately. And it appears that's what he's doing right now with one quarter still to play. The word of his loss is spread through the stands and a cheer has begun thanking King Cole. You have to wonder, with the new rule in the Missouri Valley Conference banning part-time coaches, could this be the last time we see King Cole on a Nebraska sideline? Would Nebraska be foolish enough to not retain a head coach with a winning record? Will the reigning conference champs not bring back the head coach? Surely a 7-1 record would be enough for the fans and administration. We'll have to wait and see. We wish King Cole our condolences. The packed stands of Nebraska Field saw a lot of fresh new faces during this fourth quarter route. The final record-setting score, Nebraska 119, Haskell nothing. The Cornhuskers have successfully avenged their loss just one season ago. 20 touchdowns, over 1,100 yards of offense, while holding the Haskell team to just 67 yards. There quite possibly has never been a more well-rounded and talented team in the history of Nebraska football. Wishing everyone a happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next season. My name is Phyllis, Phyllis Warner, and Jerry was my dad. As you can gather from his performance on the football field, he was a strong man, physically and spiritually. He would do anything for anybody, and everyone that knew him loved him. In 1918, Dad saw the country needed help, so he enlisted in the Army. During World War I, Dad was stationed at Mather Field, just east of Sacramento. He was training to become a pilot. He missed his family back home, but he knew where he was needed to help fight the Germans in Europe. Dad would write home to his younger sister Flora about his training and his free time in Northern California. My dear Flora, I'm in town this morning just killing time. It was hot here today as usual, but a beautiful day. Came into town last night and dined with friends. Bill, Vic, and I are all three poor Romeos, so we generally just hang out together and let the regular guys entertain the ladies. I had a rather remarkable accident. I had the poor judgment today, taking off in very soft ground. I got her off the ground all right, but when she took off, she left the soft ground with a jerk and it got away from me. I was too close to the ground to do anything but shut everything off and trust in the Lord. He stayed by me, for she stuck square on her nose after turning clear around. And not a thing was broken. I don't reckon that would happen once in a thousand times. I had my little scrape yesterday about three quarters of a mile from the hangars. The ambulance and all the officers came teaming over. I think the docs felt quite chagrined to find me feeling so well. I am completely exhausted, so I will stop while I'm able. Lots of love to all of you. Leon. 
Two cadets had a bad smash this morning, and the doctor seems quite confident that one of them will cash in. I want Pa and Ma to come out here. The trip will be a fun thing for them, and perhaps I can come home some other time when I can stay longer. I am going to dine with Daltons tomorrow night, if the old folks don't annoy me too much. The Daltons that Dad was referring to owned a local bank. They would host dances on weekends for the cadets. They used the basement as their ballroom, which happens to be where Mom met Dad. From his letters, the family was hearing of what he was learning, some accidents on base that were hard on him, which I guess was part of mentally preparing him for war. <sighs> Had a bad accident here today. Two cadets ran together 3,300 feet from the ground. Both were subjects for the meat wagon when recovered. One that did the ramming cut off the other fella's tail and took a wing off his own machine. My sweet mama is coming out here to cheer me up. I, I'm supposed to be very miserable state of mind until she gets here. At the time, the country was suffering from the flu pandemic, but my grandparents were still willing to travel to see my dad. My dear Flora, the folks arrived and of course I was very glad to see them. Home doesn't seem so far away. The folks will be down sometime this week to see me fly and look at the field. I have to be back at camp by 9 p.m. My nice little friend meets me at the depot and brings me to the post. I might add that she's really very nice and certainly treats me fully as good as if I were somebody. And that little friend he spoke of was going to be my mom. Her full name was Marguerite Dalton, but only her parents called her that. She preferred Margie. A week from next Saturday, Mrs. Dalton takes Margie and I to Frisco in her car. About 16 of us will get together at the Old Palace Hotel for a big party. Margie and I will ditch the maddening crowd and have a nice little party of our own at the Cliff House. That's the famous resort out at the beach by the Golden Gate. The next few letters to Flora Dad talked about passing his final test. Also that he was waiting for his orders to fight overseas and his growing feelings for my mom. I got Ma's good letter today and was glad she wrote. She thinks that this influenza may be showing up by this flying business. I figure on getting home before I go across. Should I get orders from New York from here? I'll see all of you on the way back. We started our final review today. The only difficult thing to do was the acrobatics. I took a lieutenant up to show him whether I could do the loops, Immelman's, tail spins, power spirals, wing overs, vertical eights, and spirals, and I knocked them all cold. On the square now. I'm sure I'm scared about the way I'm acting. And the funny part is, I'm absolutely, shamelessly about it. I can't understand it myself, but at any rate, I am really enjoying life right now. Give my love to the family, your loving brother, Leon. My mom could only see him on the weekends and was about to lose him overseas to the war so she wrote him often. They still had to learn a lot about one another, and they did that as much as they could through their letters. Hello, dearest Jerry. Just got in from a ride. It's been a wonderful warm spring day, but not a very good day for me. I did the old stunt again of fainting. Guess I shouldn't fight off a fainting spell like I always do. One always feels worse, I guess, if they don't give in to the darn things. But I'm all right, old dearest. Nothing's wrong. I'm sorry I've told you now. You'll very likely fuss and fume like Mother does. But this again, I promised I'd tell you all my bothers. That's one of them. So you now know I was bothered today. I was told my mother was very strong and active, the fainting, as anything, more than an inconvenience to her. 
Ethel said, She hoped you were going to have Vic for your best man. I'll say the end of February. What'll you say? I think we should be married about 1 p.m. If we're married the 22nd, it'll be your birthday. I love that. Doesn't it give you the biggest kick to plan our wedding? Does me. Only why the devil can't we plan it otherwise than this way? Writing. I'm afraid of the darned old flu. It's lots better here. We may not have to wear them masks in February. It's late, and I love you, but I must get to bed. Your girl, Margie. My dear Flora, suppose you read my letter to Ma saying that Margie had my goat. <laughs> I'll repeat it. She has. I tried to kid myself for a long time that she was nothing more than the others, but it was no use. I finally had to fess up. I'm very much in love with her and very happy too. Margie's different than any of the others. She's broad, lovable, big-hearted, different, and very pretty too, at least I think so. I could have stayed at Mather as an instructor, and Margie asked me to take it. I couldn't see it that way, so she never asked me again. She said she didn't want me to do something that I didn't want to do. I sure hope this flu passes all of you. It's getting pretty bad in this part of the country. It is about time to play a little poker with the boys, so bye. Your loving brother, Leon. My dad's mom, my grandmother Eliza, wrote her soon-to-be daughter-in-law a letter concerning their upcoming wedding. She wrote, Leon has written me about his engagement to you, and I am very much pleased. Much as I love him, I am not selfish enough to keep him all to myself. I am glad to have him find such a dear girl he can love and does love. We are very proud to call you our Marjorie, too. The family was excited. How neat it is that a Nebraska farm boy and a California big city banker's daughter found love, especially in the middle of a flu pandemic. The war ended, so dad never went overseas. Mom said she would go anywhere in the world to be with dad. He wanted to return to the family farm in Beaver City, Nebraska. My dearest Jerry, how's Mr. Warner this grand evening? Fine? <laughs> That's good. I just got in from seeing a pretty good show. I'd wish more than once during the evening that you were sitting close beside me, holding my hand. I'll soon see the ranch with my four eyes. The real honest-to-goodness house ranch. At the wedding, I'm not going to get fussed, excited, or anything. What is getting married? Why people do it every day? So why all the excitement and tears? I'm anxious to show you my dress. The dress. But won't. Not even if you come out a whole week or ten days sooner. You can't see it. You won't see it until you see me marching down the stairs, pale as a ghost and knees shaking. If you get the blissful chance of getting a hold of my hand, for pity's sake, do so. You're the only thing or person that will be able to keep me from rocking the boat. You're always so cool and never fussed one bit. I sure do wish I had your calm disposition. I must go to bed, dearest fellow, for I'm dead tired. And do you know I love you, love you, love you? Well, I do. Say hello to all my future family folks. Imagine the next time I'll be with you, I'll be a wife. The wife of L.G. Warner. Hmm. <laughs> L.G. Warner doesn't sound half as thrilling as Jerry. <laughs> Good night, dearest. I love you dearly, your future shadow.
Margie. Miss Marguerite Dalton has set February 20th as the date for her marriage to Lieutenant Leon George Warner. The wedding will take place at the beautiful home of the bride's parents, Mr. and Mrs. E.F. Dalton, in Boulevard Park. And though it will include, as guests only, the relatives and most intimate friends, it nevertheless will be most elaborately planned. The friends of Miss Dalton have looked forward to a larger affair later in the season, but owing to the epidemic of influenza, plans had to be rearranged. Miss Dalton has chosen Miss Ethel Sleeper as her one attendant. Lieutenant Warner recently received his discharge at Gerstner Field and returned to his home in Beaver City, Nebraska, where he will prepare a home for his bride. The young couple are planning quite an extensive honeymoon to be spent in a tour of California by automobile. After the wedding, mom and dad settled in Beaver City. I would like to point out that mom moved from an 11,000 square foot mansion to the second oldest building in Furnace County, Nebraska. The ranch started very small. It was a 10 by 14 foot hand cut log cabin. The original house was one room. My sister Alice was born a year after the wedding, then George and then Ethel. I was the fourth child, born in 1925. On Thursday, December 14th, 1927, the entire state was closed due to a blizzard. Mom went to bed early that night because she had a headache. We lost her sometime that night. She didn't have any health issues that anyone knew of. That's why it was such a shock to everyone when she died at 29. The records state she passed away from heart complications, which could explain her fainting spells. No one is ready for such a young and vibrant woman to pass away. My mom left behind a husband of eight years and four children between the ages of seven and two and a half. Because I was so young, dad sent me to live right next door with my grandparents. Aunt Flora told me that dad would leave on his horse at least once a week to visit mom's grave. She also said, no matter what, he would never break down in front of me or my siblings. He would walk out into the fields. Alone. As I got older, I'd spend the weekends with dad. After my siblings left the house, I helped him cook and clean. I asked him if he would like me to come live with him to help on the farm. He said, absolutely not. That he wanted me to stay and help his mom that we both called Ma. She needed me more than he did. Dad taught us right from wrong. One day he was making a delivery. My sister Ethel and I were riding along. As we passed a girl from a depression camp on the road, we made fun of her dirty clothes. Dad heard this and stopped. He immediately told us how awful that was. He stopped the wagon, forced us to get down, and apologized to the girl. He gave us hell for that. Here's a story that made Dad laugh every time he told it. He picked up a hitchhiker on the way into town. The hitchhiker was the wife of a local bootlegger, and she did not have the best reputation, and it was thought to be unpopular to be seen in her company. Dad made sure that plenty of people saw him drop her off right in the middle of the Beaver City Town Square. He got a kick at how many jaws dropped. There's a chance he honked the horn to get everybody's attention. Dad didn't drink in public anyway. He had a room upstairs that no one was allowed into. It's where he kept the good booze and his memories of mom. Once he drank in front of us, and it was quite a shock. In 1939, we piled into our 29 Dodge sedan and headed to Lincoln to a Cornhusker football game. Not sure if somebody recognized my dad, but a brown bottle of something found its way to our table. That day he looked happy. 
Was it the memories of being back in his college town or being on the field? We're not sure. We found it funny that it took a Nebraska game for Dad to loosen up. It was also a rough day for him because the last time he was on campus, he did the one thing he'd never allow any of us to do. He quit. For a good reason. Family. The Nebraska football program went through a lot leading up to March 6, 1911. Just days after the 1910 head coach William King Cole left the program, the Cornhusker athletic manager schedules a game. But it's not just a game. He schedules the game at home against the Michigan Wolverines. Even though Nebraska and Michigan had never played one another, there was some history that linked them together. Before becoming head coach at Michigan, Fielding Yost spent one year coaching at Nebraska. Cole not only played for Yost, but he had been an assistant coach for him at Michigan. Some say the Nebraska athletic manager scheduled this game as a personal dig towards Cole for walking away from the program to farm. But others believed this would be the game to put Nebraska football on the map. And what better way to entice a new head coach than to let them know their last game of the season would be at home against the former national champions, which led to a very important day, March 6, 1911. In one edition of a Lincoln newspaper, it announced the hiring of former Wisconsin Badger Ewald Jumbo Steam, and on a different page, it was reported that Jerry Warner had left school. Most of the 1910 conference championship team was planning on returning. Sylvie Shanka, Gus Lofgren, and Walt Schoner. Jerry Warner was not planning on returning. It looked as though his departure was in support of his former head coach. The truth? Jerry's father had invested heavily in a ranch in New Mexico. Jerry was needed back home while his father got their new place settled. To Jerry, family, not football, came first. As the season neared, the full schedule was released. The Cornhuskers would have to travel to Minnesota, Iowa, and Kansas. Home games were Kearney Normal, the Kansas Aggies, Missouri, Doan, and a November 28th meeting with Michigan. But no matter what, this entire season was leading to the game against Michigan. Practice started September 14th, and Warner was nowhere to be found. One month before the opening game against Kearney, the team was hopeful that they could coax him back. Team captain Sylvie Shanka went to Beaver City to talk to Jerry, but returned alone. Local media reported that even his fraternity contacted him. A few days later, new head coach Steam hopped a train to sit down with the Warner family. No matter what, Jerry was not going to return. He was needed at home. Unfortunately, Jerry's father was conned out of his money and the investment failed. Jerry took a job with a local alfalfa farm to help financially. On September 20th, Warner wrote a letter to the new head coach. He thanked him for visiting, but he could not make a commitment to play football in 1911. On September 26th, a former Cornhusker All-Star, local businessman, and fraternity brother John Westover made a visit to the Warner farm. It was a last-ditch effort to convince Jerry's parents that he should return to school. Westover argued that Jerry should return to campus to assist with some frat business. After his parents agreed, the local newspaper latched on and were officially on Warner Watch. September 27th, the all-conference quarterback was spotted in the stands during practice. Then, Friday the 29th, Jerry revealed to the reporters that he was re-enrolling in school. Warner rejoined the team Wednesday, October 4th. That day, he didn't get on the field. He spent the entire practice jogging on the sideline and watching. The next day, Warner played quarterback for the freshman team against the varsity defense in a full contact scrimmage. Not two days later, after just one full practice, Jerry Warner was named starting quarterback and led the team onto the field against Kearney.
early in the first quarter, Jerry Warner fresh off his big tackle moments ago. Now settles in under center at the Kearney 5. He follows his big line into the end zone with the quarterback sneak. Nebraska goes up by 10. The Antelopes will punt from their end zone, and he does not get off a good kick at all. Warner catches the line drive on the run at the 35, and he's got a lane. Racing up the left sideline, he gallops untouched for the score, Nebraska's 15th touchdown of the game. Nebraska won 117 to nothing. Jerry Warner scored four touchdowns, and he only played the first and third quarter. The team was excited about their next game against the Aggies. Unfortunately, Warner got the flu and was bedridden for most of the week. He missed every practice and lost eight pounds, which he didn't need to lose. But he was still named starter on offense as quarterback and on defense at corner. The Aggies will start this drive at their own 15-yard line, down six in the first half. Young pitches it out to his running back on a sweep right, and he is blasted eight yards deep by Jerry Warner, streaking in from his corner position. After resting much of the third quarter, it looks like Warner will return to quarterback to start the fourth. Touchdown, Nebraska! Running back Owen Frank finishes off the 45-yard drive with the three-yard tuck for the score. But the star of this drive was the field general at quarterback, pulling down 38 yards on three carries. The Cornhuskers walk away with the easy win on the road, 59-0, to go 2-0 on the season. Scoring-wise, the Steamrollers have raked in 176 points in just two games. And if you go back to the final game of the 1910 campaign, the Scarlet and Cream have outscored their opponents 295 to nothing. The Cornhuskers were about to have their biggest test so far. The Minnesota Gophers were strong and talented. They were going to give the Cornhuskers a run for their money, especially on offense. The Lincoln Star had a groundbreaking idea for the first away game. The team was very popular, so they announced that their sporting editor would travel to Northrop Field and would be seated next to the telegraph operator in the Minnesota press box. Each play would be relayed back to the star offices and announced in real time by megaphone to the gathered crowd of Cornhusker fans. On game day, there was a huge crowd in the street. Starters for the game, Shawner, Shanka, Elliott, Hornberger, Pearson, Harmon, Warner, Purdy, and Ernie and Owen Frank. Today's game attendance, 10,000. First down Nebraska on their 15. Pass, Ernie Frank to Warner to the 48 yard line. Owen Frank runs from the Nebraska 12 to the 40 yard line. First down on the Minnesota 35 yard line. Warner to Owen Frank to the 22. Next play, Frank, fumble. First quarter is over. First down Nebraska on the Minnesota 25. Pass Warner to Shawner. Fumble on the 15, Gophers ball. Second down, Gophers on the Nebraska 35. Pass Pickering to Capron. Touchdown, Minnesota. Eight yard pass, touchdown, Minnesota. Fumble, Owen Frank. Fumble, Ernie Frank. Fumble, Jerry Warner. Fumble, Shanka. Loss of five yards. Loss of 10 yards. Head coach Jumbo Steam was disappointed and said, I think the score did not show the relative merits of the two 11s. Minnesota had a strong team, and we had hoped we could turn over a new leaf and defeat them this year. But luck seemed to be against us. The Gophers line was stronger than we had anticipated, and the slowness of the field had prevented our backs from working to the best of their ability. On a dry gridiron, I think the score would have been very different. The field was wet, even though it hadn't rained in over a week nor did it rain on game day. The team wanted to blame the Gophers, but decided to just accept that they had to do better. They were prepared to take a beating. The Gophers were famous for kicking and punching. Jerry Warner walked away with another broken nose, 
a backup running back was knocked unconscious by a punch during a play, and the center reported being punched in the head and having his hand stepped on. Minnesota was rough, Nebraska was in their own head, and they couldn't answer the challenge. Because of this, leading into the Missouri game, Jumbo Steam said only two words to his players. Late in the fourth now, we're seeing a wave of reserves from the Cornhusker sideline. Nebraska's up big, 34 to nothing. Potter has taken over at quarterback, but Warner remains in at defensive back. Missouri starting out this drive on the Nebraska 27, thanks to a fumble. Roberts leads the Tiger offense to the line, a straight drop back, and hits a quick pass for five yards, and he is stopped in his tracks by Warner. He was not fooled on the play and was waiting for the receiver. And now the official is signaling first down Nebraska. Jerry Warner made yet another huge stop, his third of the game. He made the tackle and stripped the ball on the way to the ground. That may be the last we see of him today. He walks off the field responsible for roughly one quarter of Nebraska's yards on offense. First down, Nebraska. Scoreless in the first quarter here in Ames, Iowa. A 20-yard pass to running back Owen Frank just a few plays ago had given the Cornhuskers some momentum, but they find themselves third and long, and Gibson prepares to punt. The ball is away, and the Aggies refuse to fair catch. Jerry Warner steals the ball. As the ball landed in the hands of the Iowa player, Warner took the football. First down, Nebraska on the Aggie 15. Third and 10 for the Cornhuskers. After the turnover, two running plays have gone nowhere. This may be where we see the ball in the air. Running back Ernie Frank in motion right to left. Warner drops straight back and fires a strike to Frank in the flats. He's too fast and he's into the end zone. 15 yards, Warner to Frank for the score. The next game was against the Doan Tigers. Just like King Cole chose to do, Coach Steam ignored Doan and practiced for the game against the Kansas Jayhawks in the Missouri Valley Conference title. Once again, the starting squad was nearly all backups, and the first string players were on the sidelines in street clothes. But this time, even with the icy and snowy weather, the Cornhusker backups shut out the Tigers 27-0. This victory brought them to a 4-1-1 and one record. The team was 21 strong as they traveled to Lawrence. Somewhere outside Kansas City, the train carrying the team ran off the tracks. Luckily, no one was severely injured in the derailment, but the train was delayed several hours and they didn't reach the depot until 3 a.m. Nebraska's trying to punch it in for the second time, still early in the first quarter on a third and goal. Steam electing to forego a field goal attempt. The offense set up at the Kansas three. Shawner goes in motion. Warner bootlegs to the left. The short dump pass to Gibson at end on the near sideline, and he's hit right away. Gibson keeps fighting. His arms were outstretched as he hit the grass. There's the whistle. Touchdown, Nebraska. A 15 yards holding penalty pushes the Cornhuskers back to the Kansas 45. So far, the best defense the Jayhawks can muster is Nebraska being called for holding. Frank and fullback Purdy lined up in the backfield. Shawner right and Lofgren left. Warner takes the snap and drops straight back. He's looking for Shawner. He jumps to meet the oval above the defender. The defender falls down and Shawner heads for the goal. The safety has the angle and he's pushed out at the 12. It's 33 yards through the air for Nebraska. With their fifth shutout win of the 1911 season, the Nebraska Cornhuskers were back-to-back -back Missouri Valley Conference champions.
Michigan arrived at the Lincoln Haymarket Depot and were welcomed by Cornhusker and Wolverine fans. Before settling in, they held a closed practice at the Lincoln Country Club and joined a joint rally at the Municipal Auditorium. Over 1,000 fans, coaches, players, and dignitaries packed the room. Nebraska Governor Chester Aldrich was the keynote speaker, and he welcomed everyone as the crowd chanted for their teams. Yost was pushed onto the stage and delivered a speech. I assure you, we are expecting as hot a reception when we enter the field tomorrow as any we have gone against this season. Yost players took the yellow and blue flowers they were wearing and tossed them to the Cornhuskers. Jumbo Steam stepped to the podium and battling the cheers from the Michigan fans, delivered this speech. Nebraska appreciates the strength of the Michigan team, but all this talk to the effect that we are going into tomorrow's game only to hold the Michiganders down to as low a score as possible is bosh! We are going to win! We are going into the game to win! All of this tattle that we are being satisfied with a tie or a low score on our opponent is all part of a fable. Every man believes we are going to win and we are going to do it. It is an honor for us to go against this team from Michigan, which is held as one of the greatest in the country, but we are going to play football until we can play football no more. It was a perfect day for college football. Sunny skies, a slight breeze, and 61 degrees in downtown Lincoln. The gates opened at 12.30 to an enormous walk-up crowd. By the 2.30 kickoff, there was over 8,000 fans. It was finally game time. The coaches had done everything they could to prepare their players. This was the biggest game in the history of the Nebraska Cornhuskers football program. They were all ready to fight. Both teams have traded punts several times and neither appears ready to give up anytime soon. With time running out in the quarter, we're tied at zero at Cornusker Field. Quarterback Jerry Warner settles in under center at the Michigan 35. Takes the snap and rolls left. He's looking for his end down the field. He stops and looks back to his running back in the center of the field. He makes the catch behind the line and is hit immediately. But he stays on his feet. Ernest Frank regains his balance all alone up the right sideline. 15, 10, 5, touchdown Nebraska. Two officials are signaling touchdown, one is tending to an injured Wolverine, and the referee is running towards midfield blowing his whistle. They're waving off the score. After a conference, the officials will not allow the Nebraska touchdown. We're hearing that time had expired to end the quarter, and the referee said the play will not count. Some could call into question the validity of such a call, as no whistle was heard prior to the play by me, the coaches, or the players, as not one of the 22 on the field slowed down for even one second or showed the slightest hint of hesitation. Not one Wolverine or Cornhusker heeded the call of this mystery ghost whistle that takes away a long touchdown pass from Jerry Warner to Ernie Frank. One can only hope this doesn't bear too much weight on the outcome of the game. A judgment call by the referee, who incidentally was a star running back for the Michigan Wolverines just six years ago and traveled here with the team. The unconscious Michigan player has been carried to the sidelines and we can resume play. At the beginning of the second quarter, we're scoreless, but Nebraska has the ball on the Wolverine 40-yard line. 
the running game is stalled, so we can look for Nebraska to go to the air to open up the offense. And that's what they do. Shauner in his sights. The pass will go out of bounds just in front of the hands of the end, and he is furious. He's making his case to the officials that he was clearly being interfered with. They confer briefly, and no penalty. It's fullback Leonard Purdy busting up the middle behind the tough Nebraska line. Finally being brought down by a herd of Wolverines after an 18-yard gain. A late flag comes in, and Nebraska is being called for holding. The ball has been spotted at the Michigan 45, and the ball is quickly snapped and pitched to Owen Frank before the defense can get set. He uses his speed to skirt the end and is forced out after 10 quick yards. And we see another flag holding Nebraska. The beginning of this drive had started out promising, a 28-yard return by Warner, but since then, they've lost 30 yards on two late flags and nullified 28 hard-fought yards on the ground. Warner gets a handle on the punt at his own 40 and is tripped up at the 48. Owen Frank looks to be limping a bit as he heads off the field. Jumbo's steamrollers need to make something happen offensively. Purdy, Russell, and Ernie Frank are in the backfield as Warner hands it to the fullback off the left side, and he is swarmed and carried backwards before being planted in the field. It looks to be ruled an eight-yard loss. Nebraska is still failing to get anything consistently moving. They line up to punt. The snap. The ball hits Gibson in the chest. He regains control and kicks it away. It's blocked. Michigan scoops up the bounding oval, and it's team captain Conklin with a blockade of maize and blue crossing the goal line for the first score of the game. Touchdown, Michigan. Jerry Warner is now limping towards the Cornusker bench. He took a hard shot after the block punt. We may see Potter at quarter when Nebraska gets the ball back. Michigan elects to receive the kickoff after their score, keeping the ball away from the Nebraska offense, at least for the time being. An agitated Nebraska kicker puts his foot into the ball and it will bounce once and shoot through the back of the end zone into the newly constructed stands full of now very silent Cornhusker faithful. The touchback is set at the 25. Michigan's quarterback scouts out the Nebraska defense, calls his cadence, and will give to Thompson up the middle. The ball is loose! A hard hit by a streaking defender and Nebraska's Gus Lofgren jumps on the costly fumble by the fullback. First down, Nebraska on the Michigan 28. Jerry Warner does not miss any snaps and slides under center. He gives it to his fullback off the right. He's got a hole. There's nobody near him. 25, 20, 15, 10, where he's drugged down from behind. Leonard Purdy for 20 yards, making it first and goal on the eight yard line. The offense hurries to the line. The quick snap goes to Sylvie Shanko with the misdirection play from his left tackle spot. The 200-pounder drags defenders for five yards before he goes down. Second and goal on the three. The Cornhuskers are once again wasting no time getting set. The snap, the give, touchdown, Nebraska! It's the fullback Purdy into the end zone for the score. Nebraska will attempt a drop kick for the extra point as their normal kicker is still sidelined. Gibson heals it and the kick is good. Within a span of five plays, the momentum in this game has exploded, much like this home field crowd. We're once again tied up at Nebraska Field. The game clock is winding down and the Cornhuskers are driving the ball. Jerry Warner has 31 rushing yards and three first downs in the fourth quarter alone. First down at the Michigan 25, tied 6-6. Shonka pounds it off the right side for five. Warner keeps it himself for a quick two yards. This could be the game. Third and two at the Michigan 18. Warner reads the defense. Lofgren in motion and both Franks in the backfield. Shonka gets the handoff. He's running like a bull that will not be denied. Carrying Wolverines, throwing them to the ground. They manage to finally get his feet and drop the team captain after 12 yards. First down and goal to go on the five yard line. The thousands that surround Nebraska field are being treated to some unthinkable drama here today. Their Cornhuskers are five yards from the lead and the possible win over national powerhouse Michigan. Warner calls his cadence, pitches left to Frank. He's trying for the corner. He's met hard and dropped after just two yards. This could be the loudest noise ever heard in the brief history of this state. Every man, woman, and child is on their feet. 
That loudness could only be amplified if the boys in Scarlet and Cream manage to cross that white line with the football in the next two plays. Warner sets under center. Sean are in motion. He drops straight back. There's some pressure. He's hit as he throws to the corner of the end zone. It's just out of Shawner's reach. Incomplete. Third down and goal. This is Nebraska's last chance. Jumbo Steam is sending in his kicking crew. The ball spotted on the Michigan three yard line. Three points, the lead, and the win is just nine feet away. The snap. The kick. I don't need much But the shoes on my feet Black coffee in the morning A couple bites to eat I ain't impressed Well, fancy cars and diamond rings Cause I got me a treasure More precious than anything And that girl's love is more than enough so I don't need much I don't need a fancy house to put my bed in I don't need a million dollars in the bank the side by side she and I got a love that'll never die was more in a man so I don't need much. I used to think I needed no more than anything. The he who dies the richest still ends up in the grave. I'm finding out. Whatever comes our way, as long as we've got each other, we've got all we'll ever need. As that girl's love is more than enough, so I don't need much. I don't need a Rolex watch to keep my time on. I don't need much And that girl's love 
is more than enough. And my boy's love is more than enough. So I don't need.